Well, an analyst who happened to be a Hall of Famer, not a Hall of Fame analyst, but yeah, thank you. No, it was awesome. It's uh, I'm still floating on cloud line right now, and uh, I wanted to make sure I was back for the beginning of string ball and, and be around the guys and the team. But uh, yeah, man, I don't even know what to tell you guys. It's just like it's unbelievable. I cried five times a day, and uh, I'm, and that's just on top of the 48 hours that I've cried almost every 10 minutes in the last two days. So, uh, man, I'm a Hall of Famer. That's awesome. So, what's up? Am I supposed to just talk? Y'all gonna ask questions or what? So, when did you first know that you could be put on the jacket? You know, I, I never thought about it. It was never something that I ever dreamed of and it was never a, it was never a goal of mine. I just loved playing football. I started playing when I was eight, eight years old, and uh, my goal was to be an NFL player. That's all. I, for me, I tell people I was, it was no plan B for me, and not because I didn't have a plan or you know, didn't have a, a, other options. I just I didn't want to do anything else. I mean, I made up things. I had to do a speech one time as a freshman in high school, and I made up something like I wanted to be a psychologist. And the reality of it was, I wanted to be a football player, but you do research on football and you always get the same answers. Well, you know, not very many people get to do that. And, not, you know, I wasn't taking that for an answer. I remember as an eighth grader, a seventh grader, I had to fill out paperwork. And uh, you had to, because I went to school with a lot of military kids and you had to fill out a form for the federal government, for the school and whatnot. And they had a category on there for professional athletes. But it was in the same category as attorneys and professional teachers and stuff like that. And my seventh grade teacher scoffed at the idea that an athlete would be considered a professional. And I still remember it stung a little bit because that's all I ever wanted to do. But it wasn't until about year 12, 13, or 14 in my career that people started saying that you might have an opportunity to be in the Hall of Fame. And you know, I just did some research, found out what centers were in the Hall of Fame at that time and found out there were like five modern day guys. And um, then I did some more research to see how long they played, their average careers, the average time between their end of their career and their induction, and just kind of what it took. And then I knew there was three guys that were out there still that uh, hadn't been in. One in particular, and if Damani Dawson never got in, I had no shot. And um, so yeah, so I was pretty aware by the end of my career that I had an opportunity at my Yeah, there's, yeah, you don't want the call. So the way it works is um, they, you, know, you have things to go to on a Thursday and Friday night leading up to the Super Bowl. And on Saturday morning, um, you're free all mo most of the morning. And then by, they want you in your room by 2 o'clock in the afternoon because they start the voting and deliberation at 7 a.m. And the goal was to be done with the vote by 3 o'clock and then you would know by 4. And the way it works is with Mr. Baker, since he's been the director of the Hall of Fame, is he will personally knock on your door if you're if you are voted to the Hall of Fame. Um, if you didn't get it, you get a phone call, and you don't want a phone call. So, so you avoid you avoid ordering room service because you don't want them knocking on your door. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you you tell everybody not to call you, and and so today yeah that day I actually I had a friend of mine texted me and asked if I was in the room because he knew I'd been through this two years in a row. And then I got in the shower, got out, and my phone rang. And my, my heart sunk, because I came out of the shower, and I told my wife, because I'm not going to get in. I just didn't have a feeling I was going to get in. And it turned out to be the same friend. I'm like, dude, what are you doing? So I said, did you get a call yet? I said, no, <laughs> yeah, you're not supposed to call. So you don't want the call. And, um, and so he, you know, he said, oh, my bad, whatever. And then it was like, that was about 2 o'clock. And then I didn't find out till 420. And there was a, a moment in there after playing the stupid game on my app on my phone for two hours and they seeing all these text messages come up that I just put my phone down and just put my head between my legs and then as soon as I did that it made the big and it's not like a it's like a boom 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 and, I, and when that happened I jumped up out of my chair I looked at my wife and I started crying and she started crying and and uh and I we did it you know and I'm sitting there looking at her I'm bawling and she's like go answer the door and uh, yeah, so I opened the door and I, and, you know, I'm so sure you guys have seen the video, you know, it's all over the internet now, but yeah, it was just buckets coming out and I couldn't contain it. And uh, yeah, so it was, that's how I found out.
here at ASU and, and sharing experiences with her, you know, in your current capacity. Yeah. But given your history, <laughs> what, what, what's that like? This, me being here with Herm is special. Uh, I was trying to get in the coaching ranks prior to him getting the job here. It just turned out that my daughter had an opportunity to swim here for Coach Bowman and his, his staff. And so we moved here prior to her senior year when Coach Graham was still the head coach here. And I was waiting for the cycle to start, meaning the cycle of hiring and firing and was, was trying to pursue an NFL coaching job. And I, I met with Herm. I found, you know, he was the consultant to finding the next coach. And when I've heard that, I, I sent him a text. And Herm doesn't send a lot of text messages back, so they're all emojis. So he sent me a thumbs up emoji. I'm like, what does that mean? And then the two weeks later, he gets hired as the head coach and said, Coach, I don't want to be on your staff. I'm in town. I was with the Bears last season. And he gives me another thumbs up. And I was like, okay, does that mean I'm getting a job? Or does that mean, so, but I went through the interview process. I was interviewed by, by at the time was John Simon and, and more importantly, Rob Likens. And um, after the interview, I felt it went well. And they, they chose to hire Coach Christensen for the office line job. That's the one I wanted, but they offered me the quality control job or the analyst or whatever the title is. And uh, it worked out, you know, I, I, the, the hard part about the role I am, I can't coach. And we always, it's well discussed that I'm out here and I can't coach because of NCAA rules. So as an analyst in the NFL, you can be on the field and you can help coach position, be an assistant coach or coach's assistant, which are two different titles. And so we were gonna pursue that. And Herm's like, you go pursue that, we'll help you get a job. And I said, well, you know, if you, if it doesn't work out, I'd love, you know, if you can hold it. And he says, it's your job until you say no. And, and because it was relationships. And that's what this business is all about. It's about your relationships. And a coach doesn't just hire somebody just because he played in the NFL for as long as I did. You hire somebody because you have a relationship with them and you trust them. And so I, I went through it and thought the process through and didn't make sense. My daughter's gonna be on campus. Uh, it, it just, we love Scottsdale. We lived there in Scottsdale and, and we didn't want to go anywhere. And so we just, I came back and asked if I could still have the job. And, and then I, I signed on and started like in March and haven't looked back since and haven't regretted it. What's the part about getting into the Hall of Fame, whether it's just hard work that you put in or what is it exactly that just makes it so See, I knew I was going to get choked. Do you know how many people played the game of football? Like, that's the thing. It, does, it gets me. It's and Mr. Baker shared it yesterday in the what they call it the Measurement Monday meetings that we had. Over 500 people have played this game from every level, from little league all the way up to the very top level. Five over five million, and there's only 320. At this class, will make it 326 Hall of Famers, and there's only 188 Gold Jackets that are living, including this class, and. I'm one of the best. I'm one. I'm one of the best that ever stepped foot on the green grass, and I don't take that lightly. Lightly, I don't take it lightly at all. It means I did something that of five million other people wish they could do, and I did it to the highest level. And not just me. Champ Bailey, Tony Gonzalez, Gil Brandt. You know, it, uh, Ed Reed, we all did it. Ty Law and all the guys that came before us. And But we come on the backs of those, those 320-something guys that are in the Hall of Fame. We come on their backs, and we get to set a stronger foundation for the guys that come after us. And it's not because we were just great football players. We changed the game. And whatever aspect and respect, we, we changed the game. The way I played the center position, the way those guys played tight end and DBs and and for somebody that loves the game of football, not just playing the game, but just loves what it's all about, this is the, it doesn't get any better. It, it doesn't. Uh, you know, I got to be at Curtis Martin's induction. I've known Kurt Warner or everybody in Arizona is fond of Kurt and, and they're the best and I get to be with them. I mean, I get to go down the hallway and be in a room where ghosts live. And I don't know. 
Thank you. You talked about um, your limited mode in terms of your coaching on the field, but you're still around these guys and can interact with them over here and whatnot. You know, yeah. So how do you think what you what you've achieved works for players at this level that are aspiring to get to the other? You know, I, I I think every kid thinks that he's good enough to play in the NFL, and that's what makes sports so fantastic is that every kid has a dream and sometimes that, that dream ends at high school and for some kids it continues on into college and it's not always a scholarship kid sometimes it's a walk-on and sometimes it's a guy that said you're too slow you're not tall enough you're not big enough you're not fast enough but somehow their dream is still alive and they make it to college whether it be by scholarship or walk-on and and for whatever it something happens, maybe they get a growth spurt or they develop in those four or five years of college or or for somebody like me, it was just another process step in the process. It was another step I had to take to reach my green dream and my reality. And and so for me in the role that I'm in now, I've been there. I've been I've been through every level of this. I've been through the recruiting process, I've been through the being registered, I've been through talking about you're not good enough. I've seen other guys get starts over me early in my career, and I've been through it all. There's nothing in these kids. I flunked a class in college and had to overcome it. Uh, I broke up with girlfriends because they didn't understand the football space. So I've been there. I'm 48 years old. I've been married 26 years. I've got two teenagers. Two of them are in college. I understand the college life. I lived in a bubble where the average age is 26 for 16 years. And so mentally, your mind, you're, sometimes my wife says to my detriment, I, she's, I still think I'm 26, but I, I've been where they want to go, and I know how to get there. And so in that, with that knowledge and that wisdom that comes with experience, I have the ability to mentor these guys. My passion is to see young men like this, to grow up to be, be mature, young men that love their wives and treat their children right and become productive members of the community and that you have more of an impact at this level than you do at the NFL level as in those terms of growing men into men and and I really believe that that I'm here for more than just coaching football I believe I'm here to take a guy like Cole Corbrall and kind of mentor him into the process of becoming an NFL player but teaching him what it's like to be a man and I know he's got a father and he's got a mother and and you know he's got he's tight with his family, and I'm, I'm just using him because I'm more closely to the offensive line guys. But to see a kid and, and say, "Dude, you got what it takes," because that's all it takes for some guys. Somebody to tell a, a, a young player who thinks he's good enough but not quite sure to say, "You got it. You got what it takes. I'm proud of you." You know how many kids are playing this game today that nobody they've never heard the word "I'm proud of you" before from a man figure in their life, and that's something to me that's important. They the guys know that there, there's worth in what they do outside of the game of football. And and so, you know, I'm not going to be an analyst my whole life. I can promise you that. But the time that I am here and what I limited actions I can do, I can affect lives. And and that's part, that's why I'm here. That's why Herm has me here, because it's more than just football. It's about teaching men to be men. And um, and so that's what's so cool about being here. I got you, yeah. I got you. Um, from this time last year, we talked about the defensive line uh, needing a lot of improvement. How gratifying was it for you the first year here as an analyst to see that improvement of the group? You know, Benjamin, obviously, with the record year, sacks going way down from the year. year yeah. Before. What do you project? You know, I, I, it's a testament to Dave Christensen. I mean, he is a, a veteran offensive line coach. He's been a head coach. He's seen it all, done everything, especially at this level. And it's a testament to him and what he was able to do. And I just add commentary, really, to be honest with you. I do my job as an analyst. I evaluate. I, I, I scout. You know, I do advanced scouting, things like that. But to work alongside Coach C and, and giving them, hey, like, you know, I, I've seen this. I've tried this before. I think this will work with our guys. Um, it's our guys being willing to learn. And like, we, never, we didn't have a real starter at guard last year. We had three or four guys rotating through. And, and and I joke around, we won seven games. Some of it was with smoke and mirrors. And, but our guys played their butts off, and they, they never let down. And now, you know, in any other country, you know, 
an LSU and Alabama and Ohio State and Michigan, 7-5 is not going to be good enough. And it's not going to be good enough here at ASU. And Herm will tell you that. And Coach C will tell you that. Um, but we're headed in the right direction. It, it, there's a culture that Herm is building that's unlike you know, anything that's been here in, in years. And that's not a knock on the last couple coaching staffs. But he's different. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm, I'm in college football, because Herm is different. And, and, and him and myself, and I've got teammates that know Herm, they all hope we win the big one because we want to prove that you can be different and do it in a different way. And uh, so to have a guy that, you know, Benjamin, to be the number three rusher in the country, man, are you kidding me? I, you know, and, and to, to rack up 300 yards rushing against Utah and to, and to put Michigan State, you know, out of the running, those are big games. And, and that's something to build a program off of. And, and that's what we're doing. And, and that's what our guys are buying into. And that's what they believe in. Now, we got a lot of work to do this, this offseason, this next month, trying to find out who our quarterback is going to be. And, you know, we got new starters coming in. And it, it, every year in college football is a rebuilding year. You don't get to assign the same guy over and over again. I mean, you got four years. And some of these guys leave after two and three years. And so the challenge is of building a culture that guys want to stick around and not get out of here as quickly as possible. And then on top of that is bringing great guys in. We got a great signing class coming in. You know, we signed 17 out of the 19 that we wanted in the early signing period. We got a special day coming up tomorrow. And, uh, and those guys are going to add value. And we're going to win games with these guys. And we're not going to win just two games next year. I promise you that. Well, he had a question, but I want to answer his question real quick. No, I was just, I'm a little worried about you making it through the induction speech. Oh, I, I'm going to cry like a baby. No, there's, I, there's no doubt. You see, my, did you see the knock on the door? Yeah, that, that, I'm going to cry like So Mr. Baker asked me, he said, well, how? Because I guess all the guys take bets on see who's going to cry first every year. And I was like, just don't even put the money down on me. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a losing bet because I'm going to be the guy. I'm cry, I'll cry when I come up on stage. And... That's just the way I am. I like. I walked in my locker, and I don't know if you guys saw the equipment manager's Twitter the other day. And and uh, Jada Kitten is one of our equipment managers. And Jared, I was joking around with those guys last week. I said, "Man, if I make it to Hall of Fame, I want to come in. I want all the gold stuff in my lockers. I'm gonna rock it on the football field." And on Sunday morning, uh, Jerry Neely, our equipment guy, sent me. You need to go check out our Twitter feed and see what happened. And and I did. And I, I cried when I saw that. And you know, it's. And I think it's it's a testament to me, but it's a testament to people we got working here. You know, you treat people right, they'll treat you right. And and uh, I played with J uh, Jada's dad, John Kidna, and and um, so that's even more special. And my daughter, you know, she's across the way. She helped out with some of this stuff. And I walked in the morning this morning and and uh, had balloons and a cake and you know, uh, blown up pictures and edits. And one of my favorite pictures with Herm Edwards is in my lot. It's me hugging him after we won a game in New York and. And that's what makes it special. So my wife is going to be the one that presents me at the Hall of Fame and I, because she's the most special person in my life. She's the only one that's been through everything with me. Mom and dad, you know, you know, two years, four years, six years, you know, whatever. But I've been with my wife 26 years. And 29, if you count the three we dated and, and were engaged, and she knows every bump, every bruise, every broken bone, every surgery. She knows every complaint I had about every coach. She knows every teammate that I, well, I think she's forgotten more teammates than I've remembered. But, you know, when you have, when you share something like that for so long with somebody, you can't just say, I want a coach I have for three years to, to, to be that person. It's going to be my wife, and, and uh, nobody else deserves it more than her. So, but I'm going to cry. So yeah, they there there's a, a man, uh, Buswell, I think this is, I can't remember his name. He's actually he's a former player from BYU back in the yeah seventies and eighties, and uh, he's the one that does him and his crew that are all trained under him. They do your bus, but you sat I sat there yesterday and they took gosh about fifty measurements from every angle of your face and your head and. And they take pictures from every angle, and um, and so they, they started with that, and then somewhere between now and June, I got to go to his place in Utah and sit with him for a day, and so he can finish it up, and then you won't see the I don't think you see the final final one until the day of or maybe the day before or something like that. So yeah, I don't know. It's pretty cool. His name is.
Buswell. There you go. So, <laughs> Buswell. Not bust, right? But that is pretty appropriate, right? But you know, so the, yesterday, Randy, Randy, uh, Randy Moss was there and spoke to us, and kind of gives you this is what the next six months looks like because he just got inducted last year, and he that one thing he said is, you know, uh, Mr. Buswell can come to you. He goes, but it won't do you any service. You need to go spend time with him, and you sit in front of him, and you sit inches away from his face, and he just talks and. And I don't know, I'm not, I'm not an artist. I was an artist on the football field, but I have zero creative design in my head for that kind of stuff. And But it's so he can sit there and capture your face and what you're really about and all the intricacies and details of your personality. And, and so I'm looking forward to it. I can't wait to go to Utah. I'm in Salt Lake City and hang out with him for a few hours and, and just get to know him and his story. He actually played for Norm Chow, who was one of my offensive coordinators. And uh, so that's pretty neat too. So we'll have something to talk about. Everybody good? Anything else? Thanks, guys. Guys, thank you so much. Forks up. All right. Y'all have a great day.